Um, in this next talk, we're going to uh, um, have uh, Dr. Uh, Jean-Dominique Lebreton talk about some of his uh, collaborations. Um, he's over in Montpelier, and um, so you got to think of some questions because what Jean-Dominique wanted me to do, and I hope I can pull it off, I have to go back while he's, he's giving his video and get him on a Zoom call, and he's hopefully going to be projected up here, and, and I may have to relay questions. He may not be able to hear them, but uh, um, he was re really very interested. He was, uh, um, um, he was sad that he couldn't come here. Uh, Dr. Jean-Dominique Leberton received his Bachelor's of Science in Mathematics and Physics, um, and uh, a Master's of Science in Mathematics and Fundamental Applications in Computer Science. Um, these were at uh, uh, the university. Nah, God, I don't have the university there. I apologize. Uh, his, his PhD is in Advanced Studies in Applied Biology and Science. He was a faculty at the University of Lyons in France for 13 years before his transition in 1990 to the position of Director of Research at the Center for Functional and Evolutionary Ecology with the French National Center for Science uh, uh, Research. Uh, you may see, have heard of this as an acronym CNRS. It's in Montpellier where he still lives. He retired there in, in 2014 and he's now the uh, Emeritus Director of Research. With a background in statistics, he has an extensive research record on population dynamics and conservation biology. He's internationally uh, uh, influenced all sorts of wildlife uh, uh, biologists uh, as well as biometricians. Uh, with his research team, he's contributed extensively to the development of capture mark recapture theory and analytical tools, largely based on a long-term data set on black-headed goal ringing program. Um, ringing is, in Europe, the sort of bagging, banding of, of different birds. Uh, you may have heard of uh, a, a meeting that occurs, I think it's every other year, Euring, and that's the European ringing uh, group that gets together. Um, he's worked on a variety of species as well, and he's had a, a long-term history of, of harvested uh, uh, species by humans. As an expert on the demographics of such exploited populations, he's a long-standing member of the French National Office for Hunting and Wildlife. A, a large scientific committee. He and his team are also known for the development of another important software program, Surge, and later uh, advancements such as MSurge. It's very interesting to have been a grad student and watch these guys together working. And Surge was not user friendly. And there would be this battle of these French guys and Gary and these American guys of like, you can do this faster in surge, you know, and Gary would be, you know, well, you just put it in here and you run it, and they were amazing. They'd be with their fingers going through putting in 49 models. But I think a lot of that really motivated Gary into his thinking as he came up with Mark and how to go do this. I haven't seen their new stuff, and, and I'm sure it's advanced quite a bit. Uh, there, there's uh, uh, many more programs, but it's widely used uh, uh, around the world. <laughs> Again, primarily on mark recapture data. Among his many awards, and he has many, was being named an elected member of the French Academy of Sciences. And he's also been awarded the grand prize by the French Society of Ecology and Evolution, their highest honor. In reading about his grand prize award, it was neat to read that the French Society also honored his older brother, Philippe Liberton, a biochemist and phytochemist, who John Dominique admitted was important in sharing with his younger brother his passion for the scientific approach and commitment to the environment. I first met Dr. Liberton as a grad student when he and Jean Clobert came to visit David and Ken in one of their collaborations. They both had a a big sort of, I think, NSF and, and their equivalent in France, and they would go back and forth uh, talking about things that led to their seminal work. Uh, 
on, on capture, recapture, uh, mark recapture models. He's going to talk about advancement in capture, mark, recapture, and international collaboration. Start the next video. Dear friends and colleagues, even at a distance in time and space, it is quite moving for me to participate in our collective homage to David. The natural theme for my contribution to this homage is a recollection of memories about the ecological monograph paper we published in 1992 with Ken Burnham and Jean Clobert. David used to say that this paper transformed our lives, and I am going to try to say how and why it did so. However, before that, I need a few minutes to set the scene by relating when and how I met David. I had first known of David when, as a master student in Lyon, I discovered his 1972 bibliography on methods of analyzing bird banding data. The subtitle is obviously quite interesting and indeed tells us a lot. I remember I thought I would never be in touch with such a guy, somebody to me like Neil Armstrong. Then my first actual contact with David was in early 1982. I'd worked on age-dependent models for dead recoveries, developing programs for iterative estimation of parameters under different constraints, and I'd been quite interested by the paper by David, Alice Wiewolowski, and Ken about such models. I was chairing a statistical ecology session at the International Biometric Conference to be held in August 1982 in Toulouse, France. I invited David to be one of the two keynote speakers in this session. The irony of this first contact is that I did not go to the Toulouse conference as I moved to the Natural Resource Ecology Lab in Fort Collins for a six-month sabbatical in June 1982. Fort Collins was at that time a charming and fairly small city, typical of the West. Knowing that we will not meet in Toulouse, David and I decided I would visit him in Logan, Utah for a few days in September 1982. Therefore, I left Fort Collins and crossed foot on Wyoming with my Torino here in Green River. David welcomed me in several ways in particular by organizing a splendid canoe tour on the Logan Marsh with Fred Lindsay, who was working at that time on Pumas, and Fred's father. At some point, David and I were canoeing together following the Lindsays. I vividly remember that while paddling, surrounded by ibises, David asked me a question nobody had in mind at that time. Is there a way of calculating a variance for a lambda value coming out of a Leslie matrix fed by demographic parameter estimates? In my thesis, I had worked on sensitivity analysis of Leslie matrices, so I answered the delta method was doable to transfer the variation in demographic parameter estimates into a variation in lambda. We never pursued this issue together but it was clear from the chat that followed, still paddling on this marsh, that we were both keen on working together if there was an opportunity. During my second visit to Logan in November 1982, after a hectic flight in a snowstorm, we organized a small workshop with Wagner and colleagues. Fred was at that time Dean of the College of Natural Resources at Utah State and we convinced them that cycles in jackrabbit populations could only result from very unlikely demographic parameter variation. Back in France, I hosted Jean Clobert for three months and then a one-year stay in Lyon in 1983 and 1984, respectively. Jean has developed in his thesis survival estimates based on live recaptures from scratch and I convinced him that it was so smart 
that even if the idea was somewhat depressing, it could not have been already done one way or the other. Jean has indeed rediscovered Cormac's 1964 model, and we went on applying Jerem ideas to this model. We also started distributing a first version of Serge, built from a prototype version Jean had written during his thesis. It used in particular for the first time this triangular array of indices later renamed PIMS. We carefully thought of the name and felt very smart with the idea, with the idea of a surge, a big wave. We felt less smart when a friend brought us back from the US a small box of pills. <laughs> Combining flexibility, generalizations of time-dependent models, constrained models and goodness of fit test was thus clearly on the air with several excellent research groups active in this direction at the time when biometrics was the major outlet for such methodological papers. In particular, Ken Burnham and David Anderson were preparing with Cavell Brownie, Gary White and Ken Pollock a comprehensive monograph that popularized program release, a smart implementation of goodness of fit test organized into informative components. I later nicknamed this monograph the Five Bs for the Big Blue Bible by Burnham et al. because of its blue hardcover and the insights it was giving on estimation and goodness of fit testing. In this turmoil of uh, developments in a variety of directions, the Euring 1986 conference in Fachheningen was thus quite timely and brought together a large part of what became the Euring scientific community. In particular, I remember Steve Buckland gave a splendid talk about these ideas of bringing together the variety of generalization produced here and there. In Feiningen, Jean and I met with great pleasure David and Ken Donham, and I will come back to this in a minute after an anecdote about this conference. Ken Lacani gave a rather unclear talk on the difficulties of edge-dependent models for recoveries. He several times insisted Brownie was wrong. He said this, he said that, he is wrong. We all remember some dry comments by David, like any had opened the road for it. He was a rather short man. David raised his hand at the time of questions and stood up. The first thing I want to say is that Cavell Brown is a black Jamaican woman. She is six feet tall. And he went on reestablishing a correct view of these age-dependent models. The picture here of Lacani and David together is not from Hageningen, but from Euring 92 in Montpellier. As I said, David and I were both keen on working together, and during the coffee breaks at the Hageningen conference, we started chatting about the possibility of a common project. The complementarity between the Bonham Anderson and the Clover Le Breton approaches was so exciting that within this same week at Harningen, the four of us were soon discussing the joint NSF-CNRS recent call for project as the logical source of funding to apply. We proposed a synthesis of survival based on library captures, covering first in a coherent frame the most recent approaches, and secondly presenting them through a progressive series of examples, and lastly, oriented to population biologists by aiming at ecological monographs. We had access, thanks to the kindness of many colleagues, to 20 datasets on bird mammals and reptiles, with the prospect of using four or five of them. The funding we got covered visits on each side of the Atlantic. We met six times over three years, that's to say approximately every six months. Our first meeting in September 1987 took place in Raleigh at North Carolina State University where Ken Burnham was at that time. We benefited them from exchanges with Cavell Brownie who had greatly helped clarifying our ideas by commenting the 1985 Clover Le Breton paper in biometrics. The next meetings were in Montpellier in May 88 in Fort Collins where Ken had just joined David at the Fish and Wildlife Co-op unit in October 88, Fort Collins and Paris in 89, and Fort Collins again in 90. 
Besides an intensive week of scientific exchanges, this visit went for all of us opportunities of visiting around. Here is Jean Cobert at the Joyce Kilmer Memorial Forest in this part of North Carolina after our September 87 week in Raleigh. On May 15, 88, David attended the victory under the reign of Alain Prost against an unlucky Ayrton Senna at the Monaco Formula One Grand Prix. And here David and Ken took us to the front range. How did we work? In the first meetings, we discussed ideas, the theory we wanted to encompass, choice of examples. We moved progressively to assembling and revisiting the text, keeping the time together mostly for exchanges and decisions, and doing the resulting practical work for the several months between meetings. During the meetings, we were wandering among tons of ideas, sometimes, not to say often, going astray, and David was the natural and perfect regulator of the group, with accusing us in a few words when needed, in such an efficient way that we often even did not notice. The COP unit provided outstanding secretary assistance and the nine hours difference in time zones between Fort Collins and France, combined with exchanges of manuscript pages by fax, there was no email at that time, did the rest. It appeared eventually as very efficient. I used to find the section under work when arriving in the morning at the lab in Montpellier and sending it back with my comments and change at the end of the afternoon after having exchange with Jean if needed. Jean was in Paris at that time. And though we certainly did not expect that, the type manuscript was eventually 103 pages long with more than 160 references. The two main ideas in the modeling synthesis were first presenting flexible modeling techniques in the spirit of generalized linear models, including a compact model notation. This GLM analogy opened the way to the efficient model description language developed by Remy Choquet that makes eSearch so easy to use. The second point was to emphasize model selection, any analysis benefiting from this flexibility had to rely on a number of competing models that was definitely larger than in the past. That's when Ken came with a splendid joker, the AIC. The monograph seems a bit weird with a mix of test and AIC, but one has to remember we were in the prehistory of modern model selection. As we, I wrote in 1995, we put all our expertise, or at least we felt we did, into taking careful decisions and into trying to account simultaneously for multiple tests, low power in non-parsimonious models, risk of overfitting, etc. We discovered in turn that automatic model selection using AIC within the same set of biologically relevant models was a much better expert than we were. As all of us know, Ken and David later developed in a wonderful way the model selection approach and the huge advantages of AIC. The five examples presented in the paper, again out of about 20 datasets kindly made available by a wide range of colleagues, range from a simple case of constraint on survival, the deeper with three tables, to a full-size example with complex modeling decision, the Camargue Flamingo with eight tables and one figure. I remember that Ken rightly insisted on the need to conclude with a full-size, realistic, messy example. In between, the Swift example covered the treatment of groups and introduced additive effects with four tables and one figure. The Rodier example included the treatment of density dependence with seven tables, and the lizard example with seven tables and one figure covered the case of a manipulative experiment. In the case of the most realistic example, the flamingo, we resorted to extra multinomial variation with a coefficient of dispersion that could only really be viewed as a lack of fit coefficient. 
It accounted indeed for a variety of small features difficult to anticipate and difficult to take into account formally in the model structure. That was nevertheless done a few years later by Frank Cicidi, Roger Pradel and colleagues, and we see here they get narrower CI, but their point estimates are within the inflated confidence interval from our analysis, and this is the best you can expect when using an over-dispersion coefficient, since you trade a risk of bias against wider confidence intervals. In January 1991, the manuscript was fairly coherent, things were settled down and were organized, and the first presentation of our work took the form of a seminar in Laramie, reaching the blizzard. This first presentation linked in fact to one point shared by the four of us, which was the strong desire to accelerate the transfer of knowledge to population biologists. David had a particular clear view on that, since he wrote in 1993, perhaps fewer than 15 people throughout the world have a reasonable understanding of, say, 90% of the statistical methods and software available in the early 90s on capture, recapture, and ring recovery surveys. The state of affairs has changed incredibly rapidly. You know the rest of the story since you were the main actors of it workshops by a variety of groups around the world, incredible pieces of software, training of students, during conferences, etc. The speed of transfer of knowledge to population biologists, in parallel to a huge flow of innovative models and methods, that's the story. All this has been a tremendous collective success. Thanks to his vision and wisdom, David has clearly been strongly instrumental in this success, as in many other ones. To conclude, I remember an exchange with Jim Nichols that led us to say approximately that once we tied, when we look backwards, it will be fantastic to realize how much there was to do for everybody in our field and how much we made friends along this adventure. The only sad thing is that some friends are no more here. Thank you for your attention. Jean-Claude has not come on, which may be a function of, he was supposed to come on a few minutes before he was done. Uh, I, I plugged in, okay, here's what it says Montpelier time is, and he said, yeah, that'll be right. But uh, his talk at first was after lunch, which would have been about 10 o'clock his time, and so we swapped with uh, Ken Williams. Uh, but uh, let's see if he does come on here. Otherwise, I'll speak to you in French. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what I... We? Oui? <laughs> oh, I can talk like Pepe Le Pew, <laughs> who's no longer allowed to be shown, which is sad, you know. I got a womanizer. But that was the fun part of it. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell an uh, off-color story on, on Anderson since he's not here. I remember, um, I, I think Gary might have been there. I, I was being dragged along to be the TA for something. Maybe they were doing some capture recapture stuff. But we're, I volunteered, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, and we're going out for lunch and, you know, it's different strip malls. 
and there's one across and there's, you know, oriental food and a couple of us chime up, yeah, let's go have some oriental food. And he goes, oh no, you never want to eat that. Look at, there's a pet store right next to it. <laughs> I started looking at oriental restaurants and strip malls and there was always a pet store right there. <laughs> I go, so. Um, and, uh, uh, <laughs> he had a lot of those. Uh, but, but then again, it wasn't chocolate. So uh, that, uh, that was his lunch over here, right down here. We'd all go to lunch, and it was like he'd get a Coke and a cookie. You're like, how does this guy survive? What did you guys have for dinner? <laughs> Oh, I have one more try at this. Ah, uh, uh, although he's got, he mentioned he was going to contact me via WhatsApp. Via WhatsApp. And I don't. Well, I'm going to say that. Uh, He's probably an hour earlier, well, he would have contacted me, or an hour later. Um, but uh, I'm glad he chose to send us a video, because that's been a huge, huge collaboration. Um, I was curious, I, I, I assume Clobert is retired as well, do you know? Yeah. Um, but one of, uh, he came over with a PhD student or a um, postdoc, was Roger? Hey, see, I can speak French. Roger Pradel. Close, yeah. Lise Pradel. See, just you need to hear it. Yeah, yes, yeah, she's just giving up. <laughs> um, was he grad student then, or was he done? Do you know? When he came out? He was a postdoc. Yeah. But uh, another smart guy. <laughs> 